Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Would you pray with me? Creator of light and dark, we come before you this morning. As we hear the words of Christ filter into our hearts and minds, we ask that the Holy Spirit envelop us. Give us a new, bold way to think about our faith and the meaning of Christ's words as he speaks to us this morning. We ask for comforting care for those who are sick and those who are hurting this morning, and we ask for blessing upon all those who could brave this weather. So thank you, Lord, for all you've given. In Christ's name we say, amen. Well, thank you guys for fighting these horrible conditions and coming in. I know some of you guys have come from pretty far out, and uh, so thank you for showing up this morning. Uh, we will be speaking about the Beatitudes uh, for the next couple of weeks, so I hope you stay for the whole thing. But this morning, we're going to be talking about a new way that Christ gives us and changes us from the inside out. So let me start this service by saying, may the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Would you please rise this morning from singing the first time? Christ 
gave us the Beatitudes. So let us keep in mind those who need blessings as we gather together to pray for our church and the world. Father, we pray for blessing upon the leaders of this church. May they become blessed through their care of the poor and the courage that has suffered in Christ's name. We pray to the Lord. We pray for our nation's leaders that they may be granted the wisdom and the discernment necessary to make the right decisions for our country. Choices that acknowledge the presence of God in this world. We pray to you, Lord. We pray for the missionaries who have dedicated their lives <coughs> to serving the poor as they seek to spread the message of Christ's love and forgiveness to the world. We pray for those who have recently undergone surgery or are suffering serious illness in the moment. <coughs> may they make full recoveries and may this community be a blessing to them in the way that they are offered, that we can offer care and support. We pray for those in our local community who are struggling with financial difficulties. May they continue to place their hope in God, trusting in his unfailing goodness, and have the courage to take the narrow road. Lord, we pray for those who are grieving for loved ones, <coughs> lost to them through death and separation. May they be comforted by those who care. Lord, we ask for prayers for us as well. May we understand our place in this new kingdom you created. And we do it in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray our most sacred prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. First scripture reading this morning comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 31. Um, you can follow along if you want to use the few Bibles, it's on page 926. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, in the discernment of the discerning, I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the call, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. But many were powerful, not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not to reduce to nothing, things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Jesus Christ who became for us wisdom from God in righteousness and sanctification and redemption in order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boasts in the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. Amen.
So our scripture from this morning does come from Matthew 5, verses 1 through 12. And what we're finding out is that as we hear the story of this year develop, Christ is brand new to ministry. He's been baptized. Then he went out to the wilderness for temptation. Then he went, took a stroll, and found four fishermen to join him. And now we find Christ walking amongst the multitudes of people that are following him in his brand new ministry. And what we see here is that Jesus is a completely different kind of Messiah than the one the people of Israel were looking for. And if we are honest with ourselves, we too would have been looking for more of a warrior king type of master, right? Someone who would have destroyed the enemies of God, making this world easier for us and making it an easier place for us to live in. But you see, that's not the reality. The reality is Christ is our Lord, and he did not come as a conquering king, rather as a gentle servant, ready to trade away his life for other people. The Beatitudes of Jesus are a powerful reminder that the blessings of the kingdom of God are not just for those with power in this world, but these blessings are freely given to the meek, the brokenhearted, the gentle, the persecuted, the forgotten. They are available to all of humanity. They're available to every one of us because every one of us need Christ. So Jesus is making for us a new way for us all to be saved and to experience the unendings of blessings in our lives. So let us pray together. Lord, thank you for your blessings and kindness extend to every corner of humanity. You look upon the lowly and meek the same way you look upon kings and queens. And we are blessed to know you, Jesus, and blessed that you have come to save sinners like us. Amen. So our scripture reading this morning does come to us from Matthew 5, verses 1 through 12. And many of you may have heard this said before, but I want you to know that the Bible is the best-selling book of all time. And if you were in one of my Sunday school classes, we also discussed that the Bible is the most stolen book in history. That is the dichotomy, right, the dichotomy of being a human. But there is no equal to the Bible in annual sales as, sales as believers keep coming back to the word of Scripture again and again. But with that in mind, I want you to know that there is a single section of Scripture that humanity has prized throughout the gener generations. And it is, of course, found in Matthew's Gospel. It is the Sermon on the Mount. And it is just three chapters in the entire book of Matthew. Verses five, or, uh, books 5, 6, and 7. But it spe speaks volumes to us as humans. Now my prayer for you all is that you take in this one point before we start. If Jesus is who we believe him to be, if Jesus is who we say he is, then you should all come to this sermon, to the Sermon on the Mount, with the understanding that this is God himself giving humanity a sermon. Now you imagine a lowly preacher, and it's his job to help you figure out what this means. That's a tough job. So we better take these words to heart as we start looking at the very beginning of this amazing lecture as we dive into Matthew 5.12. Our passage is appropriately named the Beatitudes, and it is here that we find a very important lesson. And that lesson is that the blessings of the kingdom of God are not just for those with power, 
but they are available for the meek, the brokenhearted, the gentle, the persecuted, and the peacemakers. They are available for all because we all need Jesus Christ. But Christ in this sermon is giving us a new way for us all to be saved and to experience all the blessings that God wants to give you in this life. So let us begin by reading through the entire passage together, allowing the words of Jesus to begin working their way into our hearts and minds. So if you turn now to Matthew 5, we're going to be reading verses 1 through 12, or just look on the board, or turn your Bible on, whatever way you look at it, if that's appropriate to you, I ask that you just let these words envelop you. And it reads, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the poor in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And those are the words of God, literally, for the people of God. And together we say, thanks be to God. As we start with our passage for the day. You'll notice in Matthew 5, 1, that Jesus saw the crowds. He saw the crowds of people. Like I was telling you earlier, his ministry is brand new. He only has four disciples with him at this point. But his ministry is really gaining steam. More and more people are coming out to see who this Jesus is. This man who has healed the sick and preached the law with such understanding and authority Mind you now, this has never, not one time, no one in history has spoken like this man is speaking with this kind of authority. And if we read in an earlier chapter from last week, Matthew 4, 28 tells us that uh, the large crowds of Galilee, they're from the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan. All these people are now following this brand new ministry, this brand new rabbi. So not only were there crowds of people there, but there were also large crowds of different kinds of people there. And that's because Jesus didn't just attract the normal religious class of people. He attracted everyone. He wanted all people to come. Everyone. You see, there's just something that is different about Jesus. So let us go further now into verse 1. And we see that he went up on a mountain and sat down. Now, there could be lots of reasons for sitting on the side of a mountain. Possibly, all he wanted was a better view of all those beautiful Maybe as a pastor, or a rabbi, or as a speaker, he really enjoyed the acoustics of sitting on the side of a mountain, right? That would help his voice really project. Or maybe, as it always is with God, there was something else, something more going on. Augustine, some of you may know him as St. Augustine, one of the early church fathers, believe that there was a connection between the mountainside of Matthew 5.1 
and Mount Sinai of Exodus, where the Ten Commandments were given originally to the Jews. In his commentary on the Sermon on the Mount, he says what is meant by mountain we can well see that there stands for a greater teaching of righteousness. The lesser ones, of course, being those which were given to the Jews. But the connection being here, that God used a mountain before to teach his people, and now he's doing it again. And that brought me to this question. So what is God teaching us now from this mountain? What is so important about this sermon that Jesus needed to use a mountain for it? What greater truth is God bringing from heaven? The Beatitudes. As we continue on into Matthew 5, 3, we see that Jesus opened his mouth to teach. And he says these unforgettable and most beautiful of words. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. So who's Jesus speaking to? Who are the poor in spirit? The poor in spirit refer to those who recognize and endure their desperate place in this life. They are those who long to see God's restoration of this world through that promised Messiah. They want the kingdom to come right now, and Jesus recognizes that most, if not all these people who came out to see him, are in fact poor in spirit. And what does he say to them? He says, theirs is the kingdom of God. The kingdom belongs to those who recognize a need for salvation. But if that's not amazing enough for you, Jesus says that these people are the people who are blessed. And being blessed is a big deal in this ancient world. You see, in the Greco-Roman world of the Old Testament, the word blessed was a familiar figure of speech, or we would call it a turn of phrase today. But it's used to designate that the gods who were not subject to human frailty or to earthly frailty, and of persons who were not judged in the same way, right? These people are in a privileged state. They're in the same state as the gods. These are your kings and queens, right? Most of the kings and queens of the ancient world saw themselves as gods. Most wanted to be worshipped. But in the Jewish world of the New Testament and, and beyond, these blessings are seen as happiness of a people or a group because of a certain praiseworthy religious behaviors or attitude. They're judged to be fortunate because it is assumed that God rewards trust in him with worldly well-being. So as a modern-day reader, we can see this line of thinking going all the way back to the book of Job, right? Job 2, verses 9 and 10. Job is considered blessed when everything is going right for him. And he's considered cursed when adversity strikes his life. However, in Jesus' ministry, blessings take on a different kind of meaning. Suddenly, in opposition to the Greco-Roman culture and the Jewish thoughts of that day, blessings become linked with things like persecution, poverty, humility, peacemaking, sickness. But note that these blessings are not earthly blessings tied to what we may have or have not done in this world. It's one that will come through a faith in Christ and a commitment to that kingdom, to the kingdom of heaven. So in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is preaching or preaches a brand new way. 
He offers a better commandment and teaching to the people of God. And as we now know, it turns the world on its head. He flips everything upside down. This is a thoroughly different kingdom. As we continue down this path of thought, it is a thoroughly different kingdom that keeps, as we keep reading through Matthew, as Jesus goes on to identify several more groups of people worthy of these blessings. So the poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, the persecuted, the falsely accused. This is quite a list of people. Sure doesn't sound like they're blessed, but it is quite a distinctly different list from those who have been seen as blessed by God in the greco roman culture. The kingdom that Jesus is bringing or the kingdom that Jesus comes from is a thoroughly different kingdom than the world he was born into. His is a thoroughly different kingdom than the one we live in today as well. This is what makes um, his teaching continuously relevant to us. One commentator said that Jesus ascribes blessings Jesus ascribes blessings to the poor, the hungry, the weeping, and the hated. And not because these people accomplished anything themselves. That's not the point. Because, but because Jesus' presence signifies the initiation of the kingdom of God. It is a new reality that Christ brings. Because Jesus' presence signifies the invasion of this brand new reality. One that transcends the troubles of this age. In Jesus, we see a new way to life. A new way to blessing. And ultimately, a brand new way to salvation. Jesus brings you close. He draws people in. Those in attendance at the Sermon on the Mount were likely those on the outside of society. This is a shame culture that they live in and truly believe that if you are blessed by God, you are a wealthy person. If you are cursed by God, you are on the outside looking in. And this is apparent by the kinds of people that Jesus pronounces these blessings upon. These are people that those with power and position would have kept at arm's length at all times. <coughs> they would have stayed away from the people on the margins of society because why? Their status would be lowered. And they would be considered cursed just by touching someone. These people that the enemy would have been spewing, or the devil, whatever you want to call them, would be spewing condemnation and guilt upon them. Saying things like, why can't you just pull yourself together? You never will amount to anything in this world. You are worthless. Maybe you've heard someone make these claims about you. More than likely, you've probably said these things about yourself. But maybe you're here today, and you're well aware of your need for Jesus. You're poor in spirit. You're hungry and thirsty for God. You've been persecuted, reviled, and falsely accused. I'm here to tell you today, Jesus has a place for you. He draws you in. He brings you close. And he says to you, you are blessed. Yours is the kingdom. You will be comforted. You will inherit the earth. You will be filled. You will be shown mercy. You will see God. And you will be called children of God. Yours is the kingdom of heaven. Now the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 2.19 that you are no longer strangers or aliens. 
but fellow, fellow citizens with God's people and members of his household. So you see at the beginning of this great sermon that Christ gives us all, in Jesus, we are given a radical new way to righteousness. That is being on the right side of God. You see, and this, this new way is not based on your possessions or even your abilities. It's not based on anything you've done at all. It's not based on your position of life or your power in this world. What it is based on is Christ. Christ alone. His work at the cross was enough. Was enough to make you a saint in the kingdom of heaven. So that at the end of the day, the question of salvation becomes simple. Because Christ did all the work for us on the cross, our salvation becomes extremely simple. Do you keep God at the center of your life? Right? Have you confessed and do you believe that Jesus is your Lord and Savior? If you have not made that kind of commitment, this is a great place and time to do that. To recommit yourself to that relationship with Christ. You see, because in Christ you are no longer held at a distance. You are never told that you are not valuable enough. Because we see that our God gave his life for every single one of us. In Jesus, you are brought close. You are blessed, forgiven, and redeemed. For his is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would you please rise now as we sing our next hymn of the morning. Pass it on. Number 572. We're up on the board.
Help us have eyes to see and hearts to understand the depth of your love and blessing. Today we give out of that blessedness, dedicating ourselves to lives of justice and love, giving all that we are and all that we have to bring about your beloved community here and now. Amen. Um, ministry opportunities. So unfortunately I missed it going into the newsletter because I didn't realize that they would be due so soon, but the youth group is going to bring back Easter flowers. We found a greenhouse that we can work with. So they will be in the offering, the order form will be in the offering for the next couple of weeks. But because of the world that we live in now with things always on back order and that sort of thing, the orders are due Sunday, February 19th even though Easter is not until April, but there will be some slips in the back and it will be um, in your offering for the next couple of weeks. And then um, due to people being gone and sicknesses and things like that, I do need a second set of eyes for youth group today. If anybody can spare an hour and a half to come in and sit with us, let me know. Otherwise, I will need to cancel that for today because Jane is on vacation, pastor's not available, Diane's not here, all of that sort of thing. So. If you can come with us from 1 to 2.30, let me know. Thank you. Any others? I have some. Um, the new one board is um, well on its way to putting a defibrillator into the new church. There's one already in the old church, but we're going to put one in the new church. Uh, but we need someone who is willing to volunteer to be trained in how to use that. Because currently, uh, in our congregation, I got an email saying we have zero people who even know how to use it. And so I will be one who will probably take this class. Uh, there is, so if we have somebody who would like to come to me and say, hey, I would like to just learn how to use the AED, we can all take the class together and figure this out together. Also, I want you to notice on the back of your bulletins, we have what is called the Church Family Prayer Spotlight. Because as a church, we are very good at praying for individuals. We are not so good at praying for ourselves. And so we want to spotlight every week another group in the church or another piece of the church that needs prayer. So if you, if you feel uh, some God pulling you towards a certain direction, and you feel the church needs prayer for that certain direction, please, please come see me or any of our secretaries, and they will get it to me so we can add you to the spotlight prayer of the week. And I think that's it for me. Um, Pastor, one thing about the ADs, they do, you need to know where they're located because time is of the essence. Um, if you have to have someone who's down to know where to go to grab it, and the training is important, but I will tell you there are instructions right on the AD and it will talk you right through it. So even if you haven't been trained, don't be afraid in an emergency case to at least bring it to the site, but you do need to know where they're located. And ours is, the only one we have at the moment is located in the old church, uh, as soon as you walk in the door and you look to the right, it's a box on the wall uh, and it says AED, or AED, really big. Uh, so we need, we need people who are trained, but also need people to understand that that is available in case something happens. So, would you please rise now as we sing the final hymn of the morning.
Those who live lives pleasing to God shall not be moved. Go now to embrace the kingdom values, values of love, justice, and truth. Go now with God's blessing to live those values through the power of our challenging, faithful, loving, and empowering God. Amen. Amen.